Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the 61st Can Lions International Festival of Creativity. A reminder that you can favourite any of the seminars you see today using the Can Lions app brought to you by PhD. You can also then watch uh, at your leisure after the festival. The next seminar in the Debussy Theatre taking place now comes from Dentsu Aegis Media at MIT Media Lab. And for our next seminar, Brave Will Shine, a sequin-clad light on what brands can learn from Las Vegas. How casinos combine experience, innovation, data and magic, and how this sophisticated thinking can be applied outside the Las Vegas bubble. And as the city of sin lures with its own brand of glitz, glamour and celebrity, Brave's show boasts global megastar magician Dynamo, whose uniquely mesmerising illusions will give the Vegas-inspired talk a spectacularly dramatic resonance. We now welcome Ash Bendilo, the managing director of Brave, to explain more. A big warm welcome, please. Good afternoon, welcome. I'm Ash Bendelow, the MD of Brave, and I, with the help of a special friend today, and this box that you see suspended above here and has been since this morning, want to spend the next 40, 45 minutes or so convincing each and every one of you that what happens in Vegas shouldn't stay in Vegas. <laughs> Las Vegas. Sin City, Disneyland for adults, a mere seven and a half kilometre neon metropolis in the heart of the Nevada desert, attracting 40 million visitors that pass through empty in their pockets to the tune of $8 billion each year. Let's give that some context. As a tourist destination, that matches Paris. As a microeconomy, in its own right. That makes it into the top global 120. The guys that run the show in Vegas, the big four, MGM Resorts, Caesars Entertainment, the Wynn Resorts, and Las Vegas Sands. These guys own 90% of the casinos that you probably know so well on the Vegas Strip. And they have a combined market cap well in excess of $100 billion. It's big. Now, the inspiration behind this seminar happened about two years ago. I read an article about how a casino in Vegas would incentivize you upon check-in to sign up for a loyalty card. Now, upon providing those details when you signed up, the casino would make certain inferences on you and propensity model you in terms of your Wagering personality, so what kind of gambler are you? What kind of gambling personality do you imbue? Your loss tolerance, your dining preferences, and your spend outside of gaming. Now, most loyalty programs should and would be able to do that. There's nothing significantly new or significantly groundbreaking. However, the article went on to state that the casino manages things such as loss tolerance in real time on the casino floor to ensure a positive guest experience. This is the wow. The casino knows or believes they know how much an individual is willing or prepared to lose before a positive experience becomes a negative experience. They can then let that individual reach that threshold before a tap on the shoulder follows from a casino floor host and I say, hey Ash, rough day at the tables today. Why don't you go and have dinner on us? I'm sure your luck will change in the morning. This is the bit that got me excited. It's the, because it's the importance of divine data, not big data, because it reported it analysed and, and it fed back in real time. It actioned. It was, a create, it was a created and actionable uh, delivery 
in real time, converging the digital world with the physical world. This is what spiked my interest in this topic. Firstly, I wanted to find out what else, well, firstly, I wanted to find out is that true? And secondly, at what scale? But I also wanted to go and find out what else are they doing out there in the Nevada desert that we, the global creative community, could all learn from? What principles could be applied or transferred that would enable a car brand, a chocolate bar, a running shoe, a soft drink, to all be more Vegas? Now, Vegas does three things extremely well, and I would argue that they're sort of pioneering in terms of what we could all learn from and what could inspire us. Real-time marketing, personal context, and adaptive behavioral analysis, and the convergence of social, mobile, and local. These three things all interweave with an ambition to create a positive guest experience built around you, your preferences, and your mood. A kind of sensory planning where everything about you is considered at a single moment or a point in time. Now, let's firstly look at the context of Vegas Strip and the creative challenges and opportunities it holds. The average guest visits Vegas 1.1 times a year, with the, the frontline battleground happening in the economy of now. I have four days here. Who can give me what I want, when I want it, and make it easy for me to take it? It is the commercial epitome of instant gratification, where share of wallet is where all the marketing dollars go. And by default, whoever has the best, most scaled, real-time marketing function is likely to win. Caesars Entertainment, now I'm sure you're all aware of the global iconic brand that is Caesars Palace, but you might not be aware that Caesars also owns Bally's, Harrah's, Rio, Paris Las Vegas, the Venetian, La Flamingo, and Planet Hollywood, as well as the World Series brand Poker and another 38 properties outside of Vegas. Their CEO is this guy, Gary Loveman. Now, Gary's story, I believe, was fundamental to the change in how casinos marketed and operated in the mid to late 90s. And he set the early blueprint for what Vegas is pioneering today. Now, Gary's story is pretty unusual. He was appointed the chief operating officer of Harris Casinos in 1997. What's quite unique about that appointment was that he'd never worked in a casino before. After graduating from MIT, Loveman spent the next nine years being a professor at Harvard Business, Harvard Business School. However, it was his paper on the correlation between profits and customer loyalty and the importance of rewarding employees that interact with customers that first drew the attention of Harris. So here we have a professor of economics teaching at Harvard who now has the biggest job in a casino with zero experience. If Steve Wynn, the poster boy of casino development, was the visionary, then Gary Loveman was on the opposite end of that spectrum as the empiricist. And what he did next was breathtaking. He acknowledged that you're never going to get ahead by doing pretty well at everything. You'll only get ahead if you do really, really well at a few very, very important things. He revolutionized how the casino operated, understood, interacted, and reacted to its guests. He knew that he wasn't going to win in the short to medium term with his product. Harrah's was a $315 million brand asset that, in his own words, was mediocre by comparison to the Bellagio, a $1.9 billion property, 
And more recently, what we've seen with City Centre and Aria, a $9.2 billion property. Now, Loveman just couldn't compete. So he changed the game. And it worked. In 1997, Harris share price was $14. Just 10 years later, it was worth over $90 a share after it privatised and acquired Caesars. Let's take that in for a second. As Gary puts it, the toys inside the casino are roughly the same. However, the toy box of the Bellagio was much, much prettier. However, by adopting a strategy of becoming a customer-centric and data-rich business and being the best at it, the entire business DNA was built around that purpose. Every decision was evaluated against that point. And it's this clarity and single focus that it was enabled the business to embrace it and take that through every sort of function within the business. And this highlights some key themes within Vegas. It's genuine and sincere desire to give you the Vegas experience that you want and ensure that you have a positive experience. The person that's winning disproportionately loves you. The person that's losing disproportionately hates you. But both of those things are opportunities on how we can manage the onward experience. I think it was Einstein that once said that creativity is intelligence having fun. But I believe us, the kind of global creative community, are often still guilty of framing creativity in the confines of just words and pictures. What Vegas did was embrace the fact that if you can change, if you can change the game, if you can look at flipping the game, and see creativity as a way of solving problems when your products won't solve the problems, that can work. And that's what impressed me about Vegas. How Vegas manages the tension between creativity and behavioral science, automation and human experience. I think what I learned was that Vegas has the core idea that entrepreneurship is business having fun. That's why that they build four-story wine towers at the Mandalay Bay to create a theatrical experience for selecting the expensive wine. That is why the Bellagio is happy to build a 30-foot functioning chocolate tower at their patisserie, because they embrace the idea, they embrace the concept that when you create experiences from mundane things, you can create incremental behaviour. Now, Loveman also talks about the need to identify and master the false dichotomies. Things that just seem counterintuitive or juxtaposed, but when you can find them, when you can highlight them and unlock them, it can give you transformational growth. So what Loveman found is, what if the data tells you that to turn all your business practices upside down, to go against everything you learn, everything you believed was true, would you do it? Would you be brave enough to do the opposite of everyone else? Now, I came across some, some really interesting examples of what I found under this topic in Vegas that I'll share with you today. The first one, Vegas wants you to encounter problems. Now, it's pretty brave for any business or brand to come out and say, we don't mind you having problems with our, with our proposition or our product. But this is rooted in a behavioral theory called negative bias. And the theory supposes that if you glide through your Vegas experience, there can be no cognitive trigger for you to hang on to that experience. You may, the individual may have had a great time and whilst the memories could be positive, there could be nothing that connects the experience to the hotel that would enable me to disproportionately, um, uh, I suppose, disproportionately uh, be attuned to another hotel. It is how the casino manages 
the problem that is the thing that counts. And that's what nurtures my affinity towards a, a particular casino, not the problem itself. The next one. A casino with 100% occupancy one week from today is badly managed. Now, this is a little unfair, but again, it is true on how the best casinos revenue manage their assets by understanding behaviours of their most significant and valuable guests to a micro degree of detail. And to a certain extent, be able to build propensity models that predict exactly when a certain individual may actually want to arrive at the hotel. And when you really understand the impulsive nature of your most valuable guests, you ensure that you always have vacancies. Everyone's a VIP in Vegas, contradiction in terms. MGM Resorts International has a database the size of the UK population, nearly 70 million people on that database. 30 million of those are with, contained within their MLife program, and another 11 million of those are active and have been active within the last 12 months. Caesars has the other dominant rewards program in Vegas with similar numbers. But how can we make individual loyalty and experiences compelling and personal at all ends of the value spectrum? Vegas does this. Vegas is happy to give the guy who wants to queue jump the roller coaster at Circus Circus with his son, the same attention the, the, to a husband that wants to play his wife's favourite tune on the Bellagio Fountains, to the absolute extreme case, and this is a true story, where Caesars recreated that famous scene from The Hangover for one of their high rollers' 40th birthday parties, complete with tigers in his suite and Mike Tyson on the piano. <laughs> now, that poses the question about how we truly understand in our own individuals, and if you think of the scale of what we're talking about here, how does Vegas be able to do that? And, and others don't seem to be able to do that. Most bricks and mortar retailers don't serve the person who is worth the most to them when they enter the store. They serve who is next. And rightly or wrongly, there is evidence of tiering, uh, preferential treatment, and access all over Vegas. You know, if you are a total rewards loyalty card holder for Caesars, that gets you a queue jump at Starbucks across any of their properties. The next one. Vegas isn't about gaming anymore. Now, the evolution and rebirth of Vegas is now complete in how it's augmented its product for growth and kept innovating to stay relevant and attract new types of visitors. The last two major building developments in Vegas, the city centre and the link, added over two million square foot of prime entertainment space. Yet, it was just 1% of that two million that was given to gaming. Just 1%. It's a very visible 1%, but it's 1%. So, from gaming to resort, to integrated resort, to entertainment lifestyle brand, in and out of Vegas, on and offline. This has been the journey, and this is the vision. In just, and I know it takes a brave man to put numbers in this room, uh, but in just 20 years, revenue per occupied room in Vegas has grown in real terms from $330 to $510 per room, with 60% of the core revenue being accounted for by gaming back 20 years ago. That's just 30%. Now, and this is how Vegas has managed to plan and be disciplined in that planning and augment its product offering to stay relevant and grow the business. The next area I want to touch upon is how Vegas converges social, mobile, and local. This is a key vision of all the casino groups to create a highly developed imagining of real-time digital concierge. This is at the heart of the future and transcends creative comms into innovative service design. The opening up 
of opportunities based on the known or inferred understanding of you, plus your locality and your mood at any point in time. For those of you that have been to Vegas, you'll know that the, the paradox of choice is abundant there. And how can Vegas manage that need by converging social, mobile and local? allowing you to quickly distill and process a multitude of relevant opportunities and make choices that you may not have even known that you had in the first place very quickly and very easily. Vegas wants you to order your drinks on your mobile for beverage on demand. Vegas wants you to confirm show tickets and make dinner reservations with simple one-tap interactions. It wants to provide genuine value exchange for you sharing that information because it creates such powerful influence in the economy of now. Vegas wants to use the collective real-time nature of social to aggregate its stories for next generation millennials. So imagine Google Earth visualized in real time in terms of fun. Who's got the best day club with the best DJ lineup happening right now. It's self-fulfilling. People sharing the fun to attract other people in search of it. And that starts the chain reaction of being able to incrementally manage and optimize that person's value now, but also offer them up opportunities for what they may want to do next. So you've booked the late show or the early show at Cirque at the MGM Grand, but you haven't made any dinner reservations across the MGM Resort estate. We know that. We know that you're going to be leaving that theatre along with a thousand others at five past nine. And we can offer you up potential dining opportunities based on your mood and the obvious point around locality because we know where you are. Want to know where a great cocktail is for pre-theatre drinks? Here are four options. But this only becomes possible and will only succeed when people believe in a transparent, honest, and worthwhile value exchange. Caesars, within their total rewards program, actively want to give you 20 cents back for every dollar that you spend with them. And they want you to decide how you redeem that 20 cents, making it easy for you, removing hassle, removing barriers. And this is the ongoing debate of our industry that still creates such tension. Data is undoubtedly the fuel for shaping enhanced individual experiences. However, you may not have even known those experiences were available to you. However, it is our collective responsibility, us sat in this room, to ensure that that is not abused by being transparent in how it is used and making the value exchange created, extremely powerful and compelling. Understanding personal context with adaptive behavioral analysis. This is something Vegas really does do fantastically well that we can all learn from. As an industry, we spend millions, if not billions, on insight and understanding of our consumers. Who are they? What do they do? What do they like? What motivates them? How do they make decisions? Even the most sophisticated segmentation, profiling, and analysis models tend to want to group us as individuals in fairly rudimentary, one-dimensional ways. This isn't what real humans are like. This isn't how real humans behave. And the, the, the Vegas environment is similar to a business like Amazon's in terms of its richness of data. Each Big casino on the strip generates over a million transactions every day. And the normal approach of computers analyzing humans, such as Criterio or Amazon's recommendation engine, is that they rely on a, a series of assumptions. Because person A looks at product X and then Y, when person B wants to look at product X, they must also want to buy Y. And that is the problem with assumptions. That is the problem that they rely on rules being triggered. 
and you tend to lose a lot of the richness of that data, and you tend to soften the edges and lose the nuance of what makes you, you, and not a person who just looks like you. And this is particularly pertinent when we look at Vegas. Me in Vegas at a conference with my clients in January at CES with my Panasonic clients is a very different to me in Vegas on a stag party or a bachelor party, which in turn is very different again to me in Vegas with my wife or partner. My spend propensity, where I go, what I do, are all very, very different across those three versions of me. But Vegas is building and pioneering the infrastructure to be able to understand this. Systems like Markov Chain Monte Carlo, where two different analytical models are collided in real time to better understand and predict which version of Ash is in Vegas at that particular time and how to best revenue manage me. So, some key takeouts that I'd like you all to sort of take back to your in, uh, own agencies and to perhaps apply some of these principles to your own clients. Be real time, converging data, digital, and physical. Reconsider what you think real time is and the impact it can have on your business if it is reimagined. It is not just social response, it is not just agility. It is not just having a perspective on a, on, a, on a topical subject. How can my brand be more empathetic to, my, to, to, to the consumer? How can they remove hassle, enrich my life at moments in time where they understand me and not actually bother me when I don't want to be bothered? More con personal context and adaptive behavioral analysis. Humans aren't one-dimensional uh, beings. Our behaviors are extremely changeable, dependent upon who we're with and our emotions at a single point in time. How accurately can we predict the behavior and the next behavior of our most valuable customers? And the final point about Vegas style, social, mobile, and local. What are you doing to change behavior? and create incremental behavior by converging social, mobile, and local. Now, with all this learning, we'd now like to propose a little hypothesis, a little social experiment, and in true Vegas style, engage the help of a friend to conduct this little test today. We believe in how the Vegas casino groups have built their vision for now and for the future that we can conclude that Vegas knows you better than you know you. Please welcome Dynamo. Thank you. How's everyone doing? We'll get better than that in a minute, don't you worry. So uh, actually, before you sit down, I've got a very important job for you. Yeah. There's a box that's been hanging above the stage from the beginning of your presentation. Later on, I'm going to show these guys what's inside the box. But until that point, I need you to keep the key safe. Can you do that? Just about. OK, I think. brilliant. Thank you. Ash, everybody. <laughs> Now, we all like to think that we're spontaneous and have the freedom to express free will at any given moment. In a minute, I want to demonstrate a few things that show just how predictable we all can be. But first, I need to make sure that each and every one of you in the room is in the right frame of mind. So if we can get the house lights up a bit. It's a little bit delayed on the lights. Can we bring the house lights up? Or, or not, perhaps. I can see you guys anyway, so right, there we go. 
So I want everyone, just for a minute, don't worry, you can get them out again in a second, but everyone put your phones in your pockets. This could take a while. Um, and just do exactly as I do. All hold your hands out in front of you. Point your thumbs towards the ground. That's good for doing it up top as well. Cross your hands over. Together. Squeeze really tight. Just like that, yeah, perfect. Everyone doing it over there? Up top. Good work. Now till you head to the left. The, the other left. <laughs> then the right. And now back to the middle. And finally, without letting go, I love how someone's there still doing this with their iPad in their hand. Great. Without letting go, just do this. Okay, just me then. Well, I'm definitely in the right frame of mind right now. I'm not so sure about you guys, but let's do this anyway. So we're gonna try a simple test of free will. I want every one of you now just to clear your minds. That was quick. <laughs> and I want you all to think of a playing card. It could be any card in a deck, just not the jokers, but any other card. Has everyone got a card in mind? Awesome. I'm now gonna choose one of you at random. Um, Harry, do you have anything I can throw out? Because Harry, everyone. It's a brick. So I'm gonna throw the brick out into the audience. If you catch it, stay where you are, but stand up. Yeah? So. Has, has someone got it? Stand up. Now, some people may think that I know this gentleman and that we've prearranged this and I've practiced throwing the brick to his seat. So, I want you to throw it to somebody else. And one more time, just throw it to somewhere, someone else. It could be anywhere you want. Up, oh, by the back there. Perfect. Has someone got it? Excellent. Just stand up. Uh, someone's going to get a mic to you. Hi. Hi. What's your name? Vera. Vera? Is that right? I'm going to ask you a few simple questions. You're thinking of a card right now, yes? Yes. The first question, if you don't mind me asking, is how old are you? 43. The second question is do you have any children? Two. Two. And finally, what do you do for a job? I'm a copywriter. Okay, great. I'm not hitting on her, by the way. I'm, this is all part of this. Um, okay. For the first time, name the card out loud you were thinking of. Name the card. Eight of hearts. The eight of hearts. A second ago, I turned around and I turned one card over in this pack. And now. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I know what you're thinking. I really do. Um, <laughs> you're possibly thinking, what if she'd have chosen a different card? So if, have you still got the mic? Oh. Right, there we go. So I'm going to ask the question, if you did have a different card, what would it have been? Any card you like? Like an A, go day. The, what was that, sorry? Angel, angel, angel. Angel. 
A of spades. The ace of spades. Are you sure that's the one you want? Yeah. 100%, okay? Yeah. Because I, know. I have a special pack here. I'm going to show you why it's special. I'm going to bring this over to this table. See, the ace of spades is at the face of the deck, but that's not why this pack is special. On the back is a picture. It's actually like a little magician, a bit like myself. And I actually drew the picture on the back of every card. You chose the ace of spades. What's interesting, make sure you can all see this, is that I flick through the pack, you're going to see the magician, let me get the light up, there we go, the magician actually come to life. Thank you very much, that was brilliant. Interesting. <laughs> now I want to try something that's a bit more difficult, using a lot more people. We're going to try and create a brand new piece of magic together. To do that, I'm going to throw out the brick again. In fact, can we get the brick from back? There we go. Perfect. I'm going to throw the brick out again. If you catch it, just stand, stay where you are, but stand up. And I'll ask you a simple question. Everyone ready? Yeah. Everybody ready? Yeah. It's better. Here we go. Well, isn't caught. You got it? <laughs> just stand up. How are you doing? What's your name? Dean. Dean. Dean, in my TV shows, you know, we, I travel all over the world all different times of the year and create magic, yeah? So to, in order to create this imaginary piece of magic right now, I need to know what time of year we will be in. So name the first month that comes to mind. January. January. Perfect. Great year. A great month. Sorry. So January. Brilliant. So we're performing this piece of magic in January. I'd like you now to throw the brick to somebody else. Keep January in mind, everybody. <laughs> Hi, what's your name? Eric. Harry? Eric. Eric. Nice to meet you, Eric. Eric, so the next piece of information we need is we need to know whereabouts in the world we are when we're performing this imaginary piece of magic. So if you can give me the first city that comes to mind. Algiers. Algiers. Interesting. <laughs> nice. So in January, in Algiers. Okay, let's throw the brick again. <laughs> you stand up. Brilliant, how are you doing? Good. You right, what's your name? Rado. Rado. I'd like you now to choose what object we're doing magic with. Like in my shows, I've used helicopters, cars, you know, mobile phones, so it could be anything. Really use your imagination. So name any object that we'd be performing magic with. A soccer ball, that's quite fitting, you know, it's the World Cup and all that. Perfect. Um, so throw it to one last person. So it's January, we're in Algier, and we're doing magic with a soccer ball. And yeah, just stand up. How you doing? Right. You all right? You good? What's your name? Marcel. So, uh, Marcel. Marcel. What I'd like you now to do finally is to choose who we're doing the magic for. In the shows, I've featured Samuel L. Jackson. I've featured like Travis Barker, like lots of different celebrities. So you can choose anyone you want. They could be living or dead. It's totally up to you. Have you got someone in mind? Yeah. Name them out loud. Spike Jones. Spike Jones. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> so it's January. We're in Algier. Perform magic with a soccer ball for Spike Jones. Do you want to get the brick back up here? Watch your heads, everybody. Now, does everybody agree that these four people 
were chosen at random. Some of them didn't even want to be chosen. <laughs> so, thank you. That's all right. That's all right. And, um, and there's no possible way that neither them nor myself or anybody could have known what they were going to say beforehand. They didn't even know the questions. Right? So, I mean, there's no way that I could have possibly known or even predicted what they would say. What do you think? I think you're right. I think I'm right, yeah? yeah? Because what's really interesting is that last night I did something very similar. I sat down in my hotel room, took a long scroll, and in nice big writing, I wrote the idea for a brand new piece of magic. I rolled that scroll up, sealed it inside a tube, and then locked it inside that box, which has been hanging above the stage from the beginning of your presentation. Absolutely. Neither you, myself, or any of you in the room has been anywhere near it, right? I want to show you guys what I wrote down. Um, you do have the key, right? You have kept it safe, yeah? Yeah. Keep the key safe. You guys want to see what's inside the box? Yeah. You're going to have to do better than that. Yeah. Do you guys want to see what's inside the box? Yeah. Let's bring the box down. Ash, have you got the key? Go back up. Just hold your hand out. Join me right here. Just take hold of that end right there. It's going to be quite long, yeah? So I might need to hold it tight. So, it's winter. January is in the winter, right? <laughs> I know it's a little vague, but it gets better. In Algeria, yeah? That's close enough, yeah? <laughs> and I'm levitating a soccer ball for <laughs> Spike Jones. <laughs> hold it, hold it, hold it, hold on, hold on. P.S. Algeria <laughs> is nice in January. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have it once more for Dynamo? Thank you. Actually. Actually, 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 you guys have been so good today. I want to, I want to try one last thing. Um, it's not a prediction or anything like that. I think we've done enough of those, but I want to show you something just cool and visual. All you need to do is watch. In fact, you might want to step back a little bit. And can we get a bit of music for this, please?
I'm Dynamo. This is Ash. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. The Dynamo and Ash Bendilo from Brave. We're now having a uh, very short break, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back here at 3 p.m. when we'll be joined by Sapient Nitro.